What is the future of ethanol energy as one component of a total energy strategy? That is the subject for this evening's panel. Dr. William Corris is a Georgia Research Alliance eminent scholar, and he holds the Roberto C. Goizueta Chair of Excellence in Engineering at the Georgia Institute of Technology. Dr. Stephen Miller is a senior consulting scientist at Chevron Energy Technology Company in Houston, Texas. His work includes the research and development of applications to refine chemicals. Nick Bowdish is Director of Marketing and Sales for Fagan Incorporated, located in Granite Falls, Minnesota. Fagan is the largest developer and builder of ethanol plants in North America. And Tom Cloggis is President and Majority Stockholder of GMT Capital, an Atlanta private equity firm with almost $3 billion in assets under management. His career has been significantly devoted to managing and investing in chemical industries assets. Our panelists have short presentations that will be followed by a panel conversation and, of course, audience questions. We want to remind everybody watching the satellite feed that you can email your questions now to enterprisinggeorgia at gpb.org, as you see our address across the bottom of the screen. And now is my opportunity to turn it over to Bill. He's going to be our first panelist to provide his information. Thank you, Susan. And thank you to everyone for being here. Uh, I've got two slides, really two and a half slides maybe, uh, to put a framework around, I think, the topic that will be discussed by uh, the whole panel. Uh, and a good place to start uh, would be the first slide that shows uh, essentially a very simple looking uh, set of three blocks together. And this is essentially the basis for uh, ethanolic uh, fuels. It looks simple. You bring wood or some kind of a biomass in, and then you do a process called pretreatment, which essentially means you open up that biomass so that it can be accessed easily by uh, an enzyme, and that enzyme gets in and does its magic uh, and essentially ferments. And then ultimately uh, what, ends up, what one ends up with is a solution. It's a solution of ethanol and water, and the only problem is it's mostly water. Um, and the net result of that means that to get that into a form that is 99% ethanol, which is what we need, uh, you have to go through a significant uh, amount of energy usage. And in fact, uh, two-thirds at least of the energy that goes into that process uh, end up in something that appears almost invisible, and that is the separation process. Uh, if I could have the next slide. Uh, uh, half of this problem is related to what comes in the front end. There's another part that uh, is shown here, and that is that not everything gets turned into ethanol. Uh, a significant amount of unconverted residue ends up, and you can decide several things to do with this. One is to burn it, to use it as a fuel. Another thing you could do is take a more advanced route, go through several additional reactive steps and another separation, and what you can end up doing out of that is producing practically as much additional liquid fuel. Uh, now, I think some of the panel members uh, will comment about, is that wise or should it be used as directly as a fuel? Because the net result of this is if we're trying to minimize the carbon footprint, not always is the best thing to do making fuel. Uh, sometimes using the energy uh, directly is the best. If I could have the next slide, I'd like to address the issue of what is uh, an advanced separation unit. Uh, my area of expertise is exactly in the heartland of that question. Uh, and a good example that shows uh, what an advanced separation unit is, is something that takes how much energy it costs to do something and cuts it by a factor of 10. You may not have realized, but this happened about 40 years, or it started to happen 40 years ago when a major investment was made in a technology that looks ridiculously simple. It's called reverse osmosis. You may have heard of it. Basically, it means that you put pressure, mechanical pressure, not thermal energy, on one side of a membrane. That increases the chemical potential that forces one of the components across without ever using thermal energy. The net effect of this is that what used to be a thermally driven process for distilling water now uh, is largely been displaced. All of the new plants practically that are being built are built around uh, this more advanced technology that uses about a tenth as much energy 
produce, to produce uh, a unit of, of water. And there is no new water on the globe, um, and so you'll see more and more about this. But that's last year's answer. What we need to do is extend this into uh, the new domain and start looking at how can this be extended to the ethanolic or other kinds of separations to, to seek this factor of 10 reduction in energy intensity. Uh, roughly 15% of the energy that's used in the world goes into these kinds of separations. If you could make that 1.5%, you've made a huge step forward. Uh, the technology is underdeveloped, but it's at a very slow pace because actually uh, I think there isn't really a focus or an awareness of how important this part of the problem is. And so if I had to say one thing that needs to be done, there needs to be a much greater emphasis on, on, on this simple topic uh, that can have so many applications. All right. Thank you very much. Bill, we're going to meet to you Steve Miller from uh, Chevron. Thank you, Susan. <clears throat> I'd like to uh, step back for a minute and look at the big picture before we start narrowing down to ethanol. I think it's clear that the demand for energy in the world is increasing. If you look at the latest studies, it's predicted that by 2030 in the U.S. we're going to need an additional 6 million barrels of liquid fuel a day. That's on top of the 21 million barrels a day we're currently consuming. And then if you look outside the U.S., demand is going up even faster. So what's really less certain, frankly, is, is where are all those barrels going to come from. That's why we really need to look at all potential major sources of transportation fuel. We just can't afford, given all of the competition for oil, to ne neglect anything at this point. Um, by major, we're talking about transportation fuels that we can make in large quantities and also where we can capture economies of scale in order to deliver that fuel to the consumer at a competitive cost. Uh, we also need to take into account infrastructure. In other words, transportation of the feedstock, transportation of the product, getting that product to the customer. And while these aren't big problems at a few thousand barrels a day, when you're talking about a few million barrels a day, you can run into some major obstacles. The other thing is we need to, when we're talking about new feedstocks, there could very likely be new business models. In other words, we may not want a concentrated refinery. We may want a distributed system, but that's going to present new challenges. And then finally, we need to take account of the big picture. All of the things which don't seem apparent, but which are important, like constraints on carbon. Uh, next slide, please. So where, is, where are all these barrels going to come from? The first place, obviously, is oil. But we need to keep in mind that the oil we're going to find in the future will be in more remote areas, It'll be farther offshore. It'll be harder to find, harder to get to, and more expensive to produce. And so that means, again, we need to look at other sources besides oil. Coal is one potential source. We have a quarter of the world's uh, uh, reserves. And another, of course, is uh, biofuels. Uh, next slide, please. And so. Again, just going back to the point I raised before, we need to look at all sources of, of fuel. Technology is going to be critical. And by technology, I'm talking about developing these resources, um, producing them, transporting them, processing into the kinds of products that we want to put in our car, and then also handling the waste products that are produced. Um, also, uh, conservation and energy efficiency 
are going to be very important. We're not going to be successful in what we want to do if we just deal with the supply side of the equation. We need to also deal with the demand side. And there's a lot that we can do there, and I suppose we can talk about this later, to reduce our uh, fuel usage. And finally, how we go about developing these sources are going to be important when we're talking about millions of barrels a day. And this gets down to what I like to call our tenets of operation. The first is to minimize the impact on food and water. Uh, water is really important, I understand, in Georgia. It certainly is in California. We need to produce more fuel with less water. We need to be environmentally responsible. So getting back to water, we need to make sure that our streams and rivers aren't contaminated by pollutants such as phosphate fertilizers and pesticides. And lastly, we need to preserve the biodiversity of our planet and, and various ecosystems. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. All right, Nick, you're up. Nick right. Bowdish from Fagan Incorporated. Thanks, Susan. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to, to join you tonight and honor to speak to you on behalf of Ron and Diane Fagan, who are the owners of our company, family-owned company in Granite Falls, Minnesota. Fagan Inc. is the largest builder of uh, ethanol plants. We build dry mill, corn-based ethanol plants all across the United States. We've got a project down in Camilla, Georgia, uh, roughly 180 miles south of, of here in Atlanta. But where Fagan Inc. Uh, got its start was as an industrial contractor. We've uh, worked in power plants. We've erected some wind turbines, but really took off in, in the ethanol industry. And so that's where, where we came from. If I could jump to the next slide. We have built over 85 of the ethanol facilities in the United States. And that was, uh, a year ago, was roughly two-thirds of, of the production. Now, still over half of all the production in the, in the U.S. Every plant that Fagan Incorporated has built is a financial success. And what I mean by that is that all of them are up and running today. Not, not one has, has turned over. And then, I guess, the, the last slide that I'll just comment on is maybe why I'm on the, the panel today. And that being maybe to provide some insight of, of where we've been the last five, six years in the ethanol industry where we're, we're hoping to go and, and where we think we can go. The map in front of you dots out those, those locations and the yellow ones being the sites we're under construction right now at uh, somewhere between 30 and 35. That's, that's been varying you know, every, every other week as we finish projects off and, and start another somewhere around 33 today. But we really did get our start in the Midwest using corn as a feedstock. Uh, we went, of course, to where it was relatively the cheapest. And so that's why you see the density of plants in southwestern Minnesota, in Iowa. We've branched out from there into the eastern Corn Belt. And in the last year or two, as ethanol has, has taken a hold, the destination model being Camilla, Georgia, and our project out in New York, our two projects out in Texas, have, have come on our board. And now we're, we're spanning the United States. So we're very excited to be part of this, this industry. We completely agree with, with Mr. Wolseley's comments about this is a, a national security issue. Ethanol is certainly not the entire answer, but it can serve as a, a significant part of that answer. And that's why we're here. We're huge supporters of this industry and look forward to, uh, to being part of this dialogue tonight. Thank you very much. All right, Tom from GMT Capital. Susan, thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to address the group. Um, next slide, please. I guess my job is to talk about how do you invest a billion dollars in the energy business in three minutes. So. <laughs> And I'll start off a, yeah, <laughs> a little bit with our, our firm. We started with uh, three million under management in 1993. I'm the, the founder and uh, the chief professional gambler of the group. <laughs> we um, have had a, a good uh, return over the years and, and are, are very happy we were recognized by Barron's about three weeks ago as one of the top performing, top 50 hedge funds in the, country, in the world actually in terms of three-year performance. There are a group of 20 of us that do it. And uh, we also have an oil and gas business that we started up in 93 that uh, we've grown uh, to a reasonable size and drill oil and gas wells, exploration-oriented primarily in Wyoming, um, Texas, Alaska, and uh, Denmark. Next slide, please. We started looking at, at the um, 
One of the things we do is we, we go through a process where, where we try to lay out a bunch of facts and we spend a lot of time trying to come up with things we're 90 percent sure of. And I, given the time, I can't go through that. But then from those facts, we say, okay, what are the, what can we project off that? So about three or four years ago, we were thinking about these issues. We said, well, first of all, uh, we're sort of believers in Hubbard's Peak, which is the statistical uh, analysis that a guy named Hubbard developed to analyze oil fields. And he came up with the uh, peak in oil production in the U.S. about 10 years before it happened. He predicted to the year when it happened. And people using his same method have, have uh, predicted that oil production in the world will peak somewhere in the 2004 to 2008 time frame. So as an investor, if you, if, if you believe that, you say, well, you know, how do I take, it, take advantage of this? Um, next, uh, you know, the arable land in China and many other places is, is going down as, as deserts encroach and you have population growth. So you have a, a question of arable land going down. And then we, we felt like the um, growth in emerging markets would create demand for all these kinds of things. So we said, okay, well, how can we, how can we take advantage of this? And we said, well, first of all, you want to be long energy, um, really in almost any kind of form that you, you can find where you can be competitive in it. Um, we also thought about basic materials, copper, those kinds of things, because uh, they would supply the growing emerging economies. Uh, agriculture uh, to feed people, and you had the ethanol uh, subsidy coming in, we said that would, that would be a growth area. And all these things, in a way, are saying you want to be borrowing dollars, because it was going to be the weak currency, and buy hard assets overseas. So interestingly enough, when we, when we put all this together and said, okay, how do we invest in this, we actually did almost everything except ethanol. And the reason we didn't do ethanol was, uh, first of all, we thought it was uh, it's subsidized, 50 cents a gallon. And we don't like subsidies because government policy can change, and we can't predict when that's going to change. Uh, secondly, and this is a stock market thing, when ethanol equities came public, they came public in an environment of very, a lot of excitement, and the prices were very high. And so we said, you know, we don't really like the prices of, of the ethanols. Uh, third, at the, you know, even a year ago, ethanol was, we thought, overpriced. It was trading at 50 cents a gallon above wholesale gasoline. And we, f and it, as you know, probably it's, it's, it's uh, value as a fuel is about 75 percent of the, of gasoline. In other words, you get 75 percent of the energy from a gallon of gas, of ethanol that you get from gallon of gasoline, so we thought it should trade at 75% of the price of wholesale gasoline plus the subsidy, which would make it roughly the, so we thought ethanol prices would come down. We also felt that um, the corn supply, when you did the math about how much corn it was going to take to produce all this ethanol, you said, well, maybe I should just own corn. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and maybe the economic rent, instead of going to the ethanol producer, goes to the corn producer because it's harder to, to uh, add corn capacity than it is ethanol capacity. Um, so anyway, putting all those things together steered us away from ethanol. We actually invested heavily in the fertilizer producers, um, the seed manufacturers, uh, oil and gas companies, and, um, and even went spent a lot of time in Argentina because we said if we can go to the place where it's cheapest to produce corn in the world, how do we lose money doing that? Uh, but didn't do that because it looked like too much work. Uh, we are revisiting ethanol right now because prices are very low. We think they can come back. The stocks have come way in. Uh, we probably won't invest in it because it's a commodity business. There's a lot of plants being built. still depends on a subsidy. And we think that there will be other, perhaps more efficient ways to get uh, liquid fuels that come along down the pike that we will probably invest in. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Tom.
All right, this is your opportunity. For anyone who has questions, you can make your way to the microphone. I do have an email uh, question that was brought in to me that I'll go ahead and read for you. And again, if you have a question you'd like to direct at one particular member of the panel, that is fine. If you wanted a general, feel free to explain that as well. I've told them not to be limited. If the question, for instance, is directed at Bill, but Nick wants to respond, he has my permission up front to do so. Uh, this is from uh, David McDonald. Past attempts to become independent of foreign oil have been derailed by brief periods of cheap oil. What will keep this from happening again? Anyone want to take that? Go ahead, Tom. Well, we would say oil's cheap now. Uh, it's, it's, you, know, get, you can go drive up, you, know, you, you find oil in Saudi Arabia, you put it on a ship, you ship it all the way over here and you get it delivered to you into your tank for three dollars a gallon which is forty cents a pound it's still way cheap and that's why we're still hooked on gasoline and that's why it's so difficult for us to find alternative and get ourselves unhooked it's just it's just very very cheap and if you look at what the real cost of making ethanol is in terms of land use et cetera, et cetera, while ethanol is a great way to do it it's, it is expensive do you think the comment that uh, James Woolsey had made earlier about the reality that every time we fill up our SUV, we're essentially sending money to Saudi Arabia that is then training the terrorists, do you think any of that, do you think that connection is made, and I don't mean to, to undermine the public, but, um, but do you think that that has any well, you know, we live in an push or pull? Yeah, we live in an interconnected world. I'd say every time you buy a Barbie doll, you're funding the Chinese. And, and, I, and I think that it's, it's, it's a serious problem, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the concentration and the specialization of the world, which is what's going on, mm -hmm. you know, maybe the Saudis are a little afraid that we have a huge impact on the food supply, right? I mean, the world is interconnected. And as much as we'd like to have that not be the case, it is the case. Okay. All right. Anyone else want to weigh in? Yes. Go ahead. I'd, I'd like to talk about this issue a little bit. Uh, first of all, the whole concept of being independent mm -hmm. I don't think is realistic. Uh, we Im import about 75% uh, uh, – well, it's, it's, it's approaching 75% of our oil. The other thing that I think the audience needs to be aware of is the main country that we get oil from is Canada. And last time I looked, Canada wasn't on our enemies list. Um, the second country is, is Mexico. Uh, Saudi Arabia is, is third. Um, I think it's, it's more important that we have energy security. That is doable. And if we focus on that, uh, there's a lot that we can do there to achieve that. Uh, the, trying to be totally independent is, I think, unrealistic. Okay. Do you have any thoughts? We're moving on. <laughs> Go ahead. Tell me your name and where you're from. John Stroop from Atlanta, Slate and Search Partners. Uh, my question is about sugar cane and ethanol. Uh, let's start with Mr. Uh, Mr. Bodish, and then the others can chime in. Uh, Brazil is very good at making ethanol from sugar cane. Um, as I understand it, we at least used to grow a lot of sugar cane in the southeast. Are you building any plants? Is there investment in sugar cane? And would that be a good avenue for us versus corn or cellulosic? Uh, to just uh, go in the sugar cane to ethanol business. Sure, thanks, thanks, John. Um, the the answer to that is we, we get a lot of questions and, and phone calls. Can can we build those plants? Do we have that technology? Can we use sugar beets up in in the Red River Valley of the Dakotas and and Minnesota? And the answer in the states is that it's not the cheapest cost of production in the United States because of the structure of of dollars and subsidies for our sugar market. So while it is true that Brazil does produce it the cheapest in Brazil, it's not cost effective in the United States and, and corn is king and that's really where, where we started and, and why we're there. Um, from, from cellulose, certainly we're, we're advocates of cellulose. We haven't built any plants yet and, and don't really have any on the immediate drawing board because there's not a technology that we're comfortable with yet stamping our name on. But we have, have huge anticipation for advances coming down the pipeline and when we can get that comfort level and the investment community can get that comfort level we hope to participate in that round so that's really why we we build corn ethanol plants because in the united states given the structure of of the economics corn is king thank you john 
Go ahead and tell us your name. Could I chime in? Of course, absolutely, Bill. Sorry. Uh, the, the flow diagram that I showed sh uh, indicated that one of the key parts is pretreatment before you ever begin to do the, the process. And I think the cellulosic ethanol, uh, that's a bottleneck. Uh, it's a technology bottleneck that is being addressed uh, recently. Oak Ridge National Lab, Georgia Tech, and several other uh, institutions received a large Department of Energy grant aimed at dealing with the recalcitrance of, of, of cellulosics. Uh, it's not an unsolvable problem, but it's a very difficult problem. And I think, uh, obviously, in the southeast here, we have we're sitting on a, a gold mine of. Uh, of resource, but to actually use it as effectively as we'd like, I think we need to deal with this uh, getting open the structure so that the uh, the enzymes can do their magic. Do you have any time frame on that, Bill? Tomorrow, no. Uh, <laughs> Everything's uh, always three to five years. Yeah, uh, I, I, I think the goal, the the people that I've heard say that it's probably five or so years before. Okay. It's a very difficult problem. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that it can't be done now. It just can't be done uh, as well as we'd like. So there, it, it's definitely possible to deal with the pretreatment now. It just mm -hmm. costs money. Have you checked out Brazil? Because I think Brazil is, they well, are saying that their government funded researchers are saying that they do have a process that is working. Well, if you look at the, again, at that slide, uh, it says you deliver wood or biomass. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you're delivering sugarcane, the pretreatment is almost nothing. Uh, you don't have to do the same kind of a, a process that you do for corn or which is cheaper than for cellulose. So I think the front end of the problem uh, is, is very real. The back end that I talked about in terms of the energy footprint and carbon footprint is, is also very big. But to really get on the playing field with cellulosics, you need to deal with this pretreatment issue. All right. Go ahead and tell us your name. My name is Robin Schlinger. I work for Robin's Resumes, which is my own company. Prior to that, I spent over 20 years after I graduated from MIT as a chemical engineer working for mobile, both in energy products as well as in phosphate mining. I worked for ABB developing optimization stuff for refinery processes. I also worked in the paper industry for a little bit, so I understand your cellulose stuff. I also understand I spent time in Brazil where, driving cars that were based in alcohol technology in the 80s. So my question is this, when I graduated college in the 1970s, it was right when we ha right after the oil crisis that we had in the 1970s, and Jimmy Carter put in a policy for oil shale where we did a tremendous amount of research, funded billions upon billions of dollars with over, if I remember, thousands of people in the oil patch who were busy researching oil shale. How do we know that if the price of oil changes or the economics change that we are putting in processes now that are not going to change again as the economics and policies change. And remember, at that time, we were not concerned about global warming. We were concerned about the coming of the next ice age. Uh, Go ahead, jump in. <laughs> Steve? Uh, well, I think, first of all, it, it, for any of the, the technologies we're talking about, it's going to take a long-term commitment by industry. I think they're going to have to look at uh, well beyond the next quarter and uh, farther into the future. And that raises uh, a, a problem when you look at our industry, when you consider that about half the technical workforce is eligible to retire in the next 10 years. Uh, in order to be successful in that long-term uh, goal, we're going to have to not only replace that workforce, but bring in a lot of new talent that is uh, going to be more difficult. And one reason it'll be more difficult is the U.S. is no longer the only place, is no longer the only customer in the world for technology or scientists. And so we need to make sure that a career in science in this country is more rewarding and more accessible to scientists so that we're, we're successful in achieving that, that long-term 
commitment. I mean, for example, if you look at, at our company, in the last couple of years, most of the scientists we've hired were not born in the U.S. And uh, again, uh, if we're going to be successful, we've got to get access to all the best minds in the world to solve these problems. Go ahead, Tom. Yeah, I just, I would say, you know, you should expect failure. Uh, I don't think it's wrong to try. I mean, the energy security thing is an important thing. Not all these things are going to work. Ethanol is a great thing to try. I mean, it really is sort of the all, only alternative we have right now for liquid fuels other than, you know, converting natural, you know, coal or natural gas to liquids. So I think it's appropriate to try it. Some of them's going to work. I think what's really important is to have a feedback loop in our public policy so that if we run into unintended consequences like higher cost food supplies or it's not working, that we realize it's not working, we shift our resources to something else because it is all about picking the right paths to run down and not just run down them all. And uh, hopefully our public policy will sort those things out. Through the same sort of thing we did in the 80s and end up with basically having spent a lot of money with really nothing much to show. Yeah, we will. <laughs> <laughs> Robin, thank you. <laughs> Go ahead, tell me your name, where you're from. Uh, my name is Tom Richard. I'm from Smyrna, Georgia. Uh, should the Pentagon formally fund uh, alternative energy and should the government try to expand mass transit? Who wants to handle that one? <laughs> Well, I think to, to start, I, I think the government does have a role to support energy, and particularly in these new technologies in the, the cellulose side to offset that risk that uh, a private entity necessarily can't take on and afford to fail because their entire business is then jeopardized and over. I think it's, it's important for them to serve that role and to absorb some of that risk in partnership with, with the private entity. And I think you know, that has been important in the six different projects that uh, the government has funded along with the three bioscience research centers uh, across the nation. So that role is, is certainly important um, from our, our standpoint in, in public transport. Absolutely. I, I think it's important. I think it's going to take a lot of different things. We certainly aren't, aren't sitting in our office thinking, uh, again, that ethanol or, or be it corn-based or cellulose is, is going to take us away from where we, where we import that crude oil from. And I think what's important to mention, Steve mentioned a minute ago, Canada, Mexico, Saudi Arabia are, are the first three on the list, but also recognize the next three, Iraq, Iran, and Nigeria. So there is a real issue here, and, and Mr. Wolseley talked about that, and that is we, we need to take some of these barrels of, of crude oil that we import and find a way to not need to. And so public transportation certainly is, is an aspect and a key part of that. All right. um, Jim, you'd like to jump in. Just Please, a go quick for it. Uh, point on the Defense Department. I've recently been on a Defense Science Board panel uh, looking at exactly this issue, so I thought I'd just make one point. Um, in uh, uh, defense, one of the biggest concerns is how to make sure that military bases in the U.S. continue to operate if the grid goes down. So that puts the Defense Department in the business of figuring out a way to do renewables, to island themselves, to, to get uh, from the grid to um, uh, um, do a, essentially a triage of their electricity needs, to do what they can. And that's one thing you see in the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency doing some very good recent work on photovoltaics. So there's a, the whole electricity in the U.S. side of things is something of great interest to the Defense Department. The other thing is that the, about three-quarters of the Defense Department's energy fuel needs, anyway, are for aviation fuel. Most of it's bought overseas when you deploy. So for fuel in the United States, although there's been a push to move to coal to liquid, I think most people are now thinking that what you would do is, for training here in the United States, use the fuel that you can get from the market but uh, uh, focus on reducing the energy requirements of things like fighter aircraft and the rest with uh, substantial new designs to radically, re particularly helicopters, to reduce their fuel requirements. Okay. All right. Thank you, Jim. Go ahead. Um, I'd like to answer that question in a different way, and it gets back to a comment that was made with the last uh, question, that, that nothing came out of 
the, the work in, in the 80s. Well, in fact, something did come out of that, and what came out of it was a tremendous improvement in energy efficiency. Uh, if you look at cars, the, the uh, average gas mileage went up during that point, and, and in recent years, the, the energy efficiency of engines has continued to improve, but the problem is the cars have been getting heavier, and so that the gas mileage hasn't improved at all. And so on the other side of that equation, as I was talking about, is, is demand. And one area that the government can certainly make changes in is uh, gas mileage for automobiles. Um, I don't think we need to wait for plug-in hybrids. The, the problem I have with, with that whole discussion is it sort of says, let's wait for this new technology to come along and then we'll do something about it. Remember, if you go from 50 miles a gallon to 100 miles a gallon, you drive 100 miles, you've only saved one gallon of gasoline. But if you can go from 25 miles a gallon to 50, now when you drive 100 miles, you save two gallons. And that's something that we can do today. They're doing it in Europe. There's no reason why this country shouldn't have as much efficiency in its automobiles as you have in other parts of the world. And that's something that I think the government could be a lot more proactive uh, concerning. A related issue, I think, is as the efficiency in gas mileage goes up, people drive more, too. So I think it's, it's the responsibility is, is not just all on technology. It's also on people paying attention because uh, you, you can double your efficiency, but if you drive twice as much, you're in the same fix. We're going to go ahead and, and wrap here. We have to, in the interest of time, for everybody who's joining us via satellite. But hang on, everybody. This does conclude the satellite portion of our broadcast. Some locations watching the satellite feed and our audience here in Atlanta, Georgia, will continue the discussion after a short break. We would like to thank our keynote speaker, James Woolsey, our panelists, the program partners, and tonight's event sponsor, General Electric, for making this event possible. The next Enterprising Georgia Satellite Live program will be announced very soon, so be on the watch for that. You can watch tonight's program program archived on the internet by linking to it from the MIT Enterprise Forum of Atlanta website. The MIT Enterprise Forum site is found at www.mitforumatlanta.org. Thank you for joining us for this first episode in our new series of Enterprising Georgia broadcasts. I'm Susan Hoffman. Good night.